Greetings everyone and welcome back to the bench. This video is part two of the JFET, the Junction Field Effect Transistor. In the first part we talked about the characteristics of the JFET, how it works. If you recall the diagrams I had here, we'll certainly revisit this again. In part two we're going to take a look at actually making a usable amplifier, a little preamp circuit. And as I said before, this is not a college course. This is meant to be an introduction to the hobbyist who wants to understand the JFET a little better and be able to make a simple amplifier circuit. Before I get into this, I want to mention that Ed Yahoo over on KISS Analog, I'll put a link in the description, is now in the midst of working on the switch mode power supply for the JAT501 amplifier project. He's done a couple videos already, and I think it's a pretty interesting start. And if you want to understand switch mode supply design, starting from square one, including power factor correction, this is a very good start. I would recommend taking a look at his videos subscribing to his channel if you would like to follow that. Okay, so now let's take a look at a simple JFET amplifier. How do we design this thing? Now, if you recall from the last video, the JFET has an extremely high input impedance. And this is the main reason you'd want to select the JFET. It has a very high input impedance. In the way the JFET behaves, it's not going to have a lot of gain when used as an amplifier. So when you're making a decision on the type of transistor to use, if you need extreme high impedance, you might want to look to the JFET. So why might you need an extremely high impedance? Well, there are a lot of transducers, you know, from musical instruments, ceramic type transducers, for example, that are used in some photo type cartridges, they can actually sound pretty good if their output is not loaded down too much. So really, any situation where you need an extremely high input impedance or to load your previous circuit or transducer down minimally, the JFET amplifier would be a good device to use. And as you shall see, it's not too hard to design a simple amplifier for. If you watched a video I did a few months back about designing a little transistor amplifier using a BJT type bipolar junction transistor with voltage divider bias, there was quite a few steps we had to go through to get to the finished design. Okay, so let's say you decided to use a JFET. So now you need to determine the resistor values, the current, supply voltage, things like that. I'm not going to be deeply concerned with the amplification at this point. If you need a JFET circuit to have a lot of gain, you might need to add an additional stage. Because like I said, due to the characteristics of the JFET, you don't get a lot of gain from the amplifier. You'll benefit from some gain, but it's not going to be like a BJT type amplifier circuit. To start off, I'm going to use a 12 volt supply. And I know that I want the output or the drain to have somewhere around half the supply voltage so we have plenty of room for voltage swing without clipping. So now I need to determine our output impedance. And because the JFET, just like the BJT, acts as a current source, its impedance is extremely high. So the output impedance is pretty much set by the value of this resistor. What impedance is this circuit going to drive? And I think this is a point of confusion. I'm sure in your studies of electronics you've heard that you always match impedances for maximum power transfer. And yes, that is true, but in this case we're not really concerned with power, we're concerned with signal level. Because if you matched impedance, in other words, if the output impedance of our little amplifier here matched the input impedance, 
that would cause our voltage at this node to be one half of its unloaded output voltage. So that's a 6 dB loss. And that may not be desirable. So that's why I said in the other video when I was designing an amplifier around a BJT that the output impedance of the circuit should be quite a bit less than the impedance that it's driving. How much less? Again, it depends on how much signal you can lose. You know, one-tenth would be nice, but in the real world, you can't necessarily get that low because you have to remember you have current here. You might be operating on batteries. You don't want to have a whole lot of current through the circuit that's drawing down your batteries. So you might want to go with something at least half. So let's say we're driving a 10 kilo ohm impedance in the next stage. It would be nice if this was 5K or less. I'm going to go with 3.3K here. So if we have 12 volt supply and we want 6 volts here, about half the supply voltage, 12 minus 6 equals 6. So we can calculate the drain current. So we just take 6 volts divided by 3.3K, and that comes out a little under 2, uh, 1.8 milliamps. Okay, so I wrote in some of the figures here. We got our 12 volts, our 3K3 resistor. Our current going through the drain circuit here is 1.8 milliamps. And one thing you should know about the JFET is that same current is going to be flowing in the source. Because recall that this junction's reverse biased. It's not contributing any additional current. You know, it's not sourcing or sinking any additional current. So we have the same current in the source part of this circuit. So with that information, we can figure the value of RS. And we want the voltage drop across this resistor to allow us to set the gate to source voltage to what we need. So 1.8 milliamps flows in our circuit. So that's where we need to look at this chart from the other video here. So if we look at our graph for a hypothetical JFET, well, we want 1.8 milliamps, which would be around here on the y-axis. And we draw a horizontal line out to a point on this curve and then go down vertically. So that would be negative 0.7 volts or so. You know, just eyeballing it. So we want to choose a resistance that would give us a 0.7 volt drop with 1.8 milliamps flowing through it. Well, if you do your Ohm's law, that comes out to 388 ohms which the nearest common resistor value, E12 value, would be around 390 ohms. Now keep in mind, like I said in the last video, of the, the issue of parameter spread with these JFETs. Now you'll find that the value can vary widely, so you're probably going to have to tweak the circuit a little bit, you know, play with the resistance value to get it where you want it. If the value is off, you'll notice that this voltage will vary somewhat. But I wouldn't be too concerned if this ends up being plus or minus a volt. It's not a big deal. You're probably not going to get a huge rail-to-rail -rail waveform from the circuit anyway. So if this is, you know, 7 volts or maybe 5 volts, it's not a big deal. Yeah, close enough. So now we need to know what the value of RG is, which ties from gate to ground or common in our circuit. And this depends on what you want the input impedance to be. Typically, you would use a value of around 1 mega ohm. It could be less. It could be more. I wouldn't have any more input impedance than you need. But again, you have to look at what's driving this input and how much you want to load that down. So what happens when we tie the gate to ground, because we have the voltage drop across this resistor, that makes the gate more negative 
than the source. So that's how we get that negative voltage that the gate needs to reverse bias it and set that current. One thing I'll say about selecting your input impedance here with this resistor is, you know, you can go extremely high like 5 meg or 10 meg, but beware of a gotcha. If you're driving the circuit with a extremely high impedance signal, you have to remember that there's junction capacitance, this is what's known as the Miller effect, which acts as a capacitance that's feeding back to the gate. So what can happen is, you know, with an extremely high impedance signal, you can actually roll off at higher frequencies. So like I said, don't use any more impedance than you need, and just be aware of that when you're driving your circuit here. Now you may or may not need a capacitance here. If the signal you're putting into this amplifier has DC component on it, it could affect the voltage on the gate and throw off your biasing and everything so you might need to put a capacitance there and the value of that depends on your input impedance it's the capacitance reactive formula and like I did in the other video I'll leave that up to you to calculate I'm just going to grab like a 0.1 or something that'll be plenty for this okay it's fun time equation time everybody likes equations right so what is the gain of this circuit? Well, just like with the bipolar junction transistor, we can think of this resistor as the collector and this is the emitter. And in that case, it was the collector resistor over the emitter resistance. And that was roughly the gain of the amplifier circuit. But in this case, we're calling it the drain and the source. And it's the same thing, it's RD over RS gives us a rough estimate of the gain. Now with the bipolar junction transistor, I was ignoring that a little bit of additional base current and the intrinsic emitter resistance, which is 26 ohms per milliamp, an inverse relationship. Because the emitter resistor was so much larger than that, an order of magnitude larger, I just ignored it to simplify the equation. Now keep in mind that this is inverted, the signal will be inverted from your input signal, so there's a negative sign there. Now a much closer estimate of the gain would be RD over RS plus 1 over the transconductance, which is G sub M. The SI unit for that is called Siemens. How do you get this value? So to find the transconductance, you measure the change in voltage you're putting in on this gate here and measure the change in current that you get out. So if we look at the graph here again, so if I varied the gate voltage between negative 0.5 and negative 1.5, I can measure the current at negative 0.5 here and we see that it's, let's say like 2.3, and at negative 1.5, it's a little less than 1 milliamp. So that change in current over the change in gate to source voltage is the transconductance. And when you're dealing with AC signals, it's technically an impedance, what they call admittance. That's where you get into those weird terms and I'm not going to really dwell into those here. So we're calling this conductance because it's the inverse of resistance. You know, the Ohm's law for resistance is voltage over current, and here we have current over voltage, so that's where they get that conductance name from. In fact, you'll sometimes see conductance represented with the upside down Ohm's symbol, the omega symbol. But enough of that, let's continue on with our circuit here. So what I'm going to do is just build this out on the breadboard and see how it works out. Because I used my hypothetical device here, I might have to tweak this to match the real device. And of course, in doing so, that'll affect the gain that we get. And by the way, the gain with the values of resistors that we're using would be around eight and a half 
And if we consider the transconductance, it's actually going to be somewhat less than that. Okay, so right here on the board is the circuit. This is the drain resistor. This one sticking up is the gate and the source resistor next to it. Now I don't expect this to give me proper values because when I drew this graph, I literally just drew this curve and threw some numbers on the paper here. So this doesn't represent any actual device and I'm using the MPF 102 that I bought from Radio Shack. But you know that's what I have here to play with. So I'm sure I'm gonna have to tweak this circuit. So let's see what we're getting here. So let's see what the drain voltage is. We wanted about six. Uh, let me check the supply voltage. 12 volts, close enough. So at the drain here, hard to do this to the viewfinder. Yeah, we're a little low, 3.3 volts. And we're getting 1 volt. So that would put negative 1 volt on the gate. So we're a little high there with the actual device. However, this would still work. It would still be an amplifier as long as my output signal didn't, you know, swing down to 0 volts. I still have, you know, about 3.3 volts peak of swing to work with. But I think I'll adjust the source resistor to get a little closer. Okay, so I changed the source resistor to a value that would work better with a real-world component, at least the MPF-102. So our drain voltage is pretty close, 5.7 roughly, close enough. The drop across our source resistor is 1.26. That makes the gate negative 1.26. That means our amplification factor has dropped because you know, with a real world device to get what I wanted in this design, I had to go from 390, which was just an arbitrary value from the hypothetical graph there, to a real world device, 680. So our gain of around 8 is now more like four, which makes more sense for a JFET type amplifier. Like I say, they're not gonna have a lot of gain. Okay, I'm connecting a signal source to the amplifier. We'll say 172 millivolts going in, 527 coming out. So that gives us a gain of around three. So somewhat less than what you would figure from the ratio of the drain and source resistors. So if you want to be more accurate, you probably want to consider the transconductance of the JFET when figuring the gain. There's more things I wanted to show you with the JFET, but I'll save it for another video. I won't consider it part of this series because I just wanted to make this a two-part video and this is kind of getting long, so we'll save it for later. So I hope it made sense. The way I went at it may not be the same way somebody else would go at it. So keep that in mind if you're watching other videos. But I hope you got something out of this. And I appreciate you watching.